Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Fire Emblem map design guide. My name is Pandan, and today we're going to talk about making unique objectives for your Fire Emblem maps. So after I made the Dagdar video, that framework for map design that I personally use when I'm creating maps and designing chapters, I wanted to hone in a little bit more on this piece around unique objectives. I think one of the things that makes maps really stand out to me, and when I think of my favorite maps to play across Fire Emblem, some of the things that tend to make me remember them are the unique objectives. Like, for example, on the flip side, like a game like Birthright, I really don't remember much about it at all because it's just route maps. And like when you're doing route, 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 every map for like 20 maps, they all kind of start to feel the same and blend together. Well, I think if you do a little bit more um, on making your maps unique and varied throughout the game, you can create a much more memorable experience. Like I think everyone remembers how tricky the Xavier recruitment is, for example. That's a unique objective. Well, it's not the main objective. We're going to talk a little bit about how to create good main and side objectives and put them together to make really compelling maps. And this is all set to... Masayoki Takanaka's 1979 album, All of Me. I was listening to this this morning, and it's groovy, and we're going to listen to it while I talk about maps. So let's keep it moving. So what are we going to learn today? You're going to understand the various objective types in Fire Emblem. I think this will be really straightforward for anyone watching this video. There are a lot of different map objectives that appeared throughout the series and a few that are native to GBA that we'll talk about, and we'll go through them and just understand, like, what are your options? What can you do? We'll talk more about how to use objectives and side objectives to make compelling and fair maps. So an objective by itself is kind of boring. Like if the only thing your map is asking the player to do is one thing, it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty simple. Not to say that it doesn't have a place, but you can make a map much more interesting and varied if you have multiple things going on that the player wants to achieve. Even if they don't necessarily all need to be completed to achieve a goal, Creating these different incentives or these different side objectives that weave together into the overall winning objective can be really, really key in making a map memorable and most importantly, fun to play. And lastly, we'll talk about how to avoid putting the player in unfair, unwinnable, or situations that aren't fun to play. We won't talk about this one too much, but I think by adhering to some of these tips, we'll get to some of these pieces and cover kind of the, the inverse of that. So if it's good, like how do we make sure it's not bad, more or less? I didn't realize this album had some lyrics, but whatever. I'm going to just lower this a little bit on the back end. A little cursor. Oh, it's so groovy, though. All right. Anyway, so let's review some map objectives. So Macklin's here. He knows a thing or two about map objectives. He was in FE1. Um, but these are the ones that are standard in GBA. So if you're firing open FE Builder, you're ROM hacking, you're going to see that the chapter data editor is going to give you these options here. Uh, C's, it's classic. It's the first objective ever made. You have to get your lord to a specific point to seize and end the map. So you go to a tile and hit a button. Usually this is done by a lord unit. If you're the last promise, you might have multiple units that are able to seize at different points. So seize is a pretty classic objective. Uh, you can do this one pretty pretty well. I'm pretty sure we've all played seize maps. Defeat bosses like Seize, only you don't need a lord or anyone to actually like confirm that they've hit a certain space. So this is usually good if you want to do a boss that moves, which can be a little bit scarier. Or if the map doesn't take place in a place where it makes thematic sense to actually seize a specific point. Then we have Route, which is defeat all of the enemies. And lastly, Survive and Defend, which are pretty similar, so I'll talk about them in the same breath. But essentially, this is some type of timer where your objective is to not die. Generally, these maps are a little bit more enemy dense. Generally, they have incentives to make you pull out from the center point. And in the case of defend, there might be specific units or specific points like a throne or a castle gate that need to be defended so that you thematically win the map before like a reinforcement arrives or something else, right? So these are the standard objectives you can work with. You can do a lot with just these ones. Um, and this is what's like pretty standard and easy to set up in GBA. And I work a lot with these ones. I would say like 95% of my maps are using this kind of stuff. But let's take a look at some of the other map, some of the other um, objectives that we've seen throughout the history of Fire Emblem. 
And we've got a couple others. We have Escape, one of my personal favorites. Uh, in Thracia, you have to escape with all of your units and your Lord escaping last. Um, other times, Escape can just be the Lord getting to a certain point. And it's basically, in that case, like a Seize. But thematically, it's a little bit different. Maybe the Escape point isn't necessarily covered. Um, maybe there's a boss that's chasing you or something like that or something blocking you to, from getting to that point. So different ways to go about this. Um, and this one's pretty straightforward to set up in GBA. You just need to set a seize point and then change some of the text so that it shows up as escape. Arrive, also fairly similar to escape or seize. Um, sometimes you might just be able to wait on the tile through a range event. Some people like doing it like that. I've done it as like a seize personally. Um, and this, again, it all depends thematically on your map like i might be escaping a map if i'm running away from a boss i might be arriving if i need to like get on a boat then we have talk so this is one that's in um a couple different games Mo the one that comes to mind first is chapter i think it's 16x in fe7 where you talk to fargus to end the map in the port of badan chapter so different things you can do. You can set a flag to trigger the seize event, like once you talk to a specific unit. I think Dream of Five does this as well, where you have to talk to a specific unit to end the map. But another way you can handle something like that, if there's like an NPC that you're trying to reinforce and talking to them will help or whatever. Score three points or seize multiple points. This is um, actually another FE7 objective. If you remember Chapter 25 in Hector Mode, Crazed Beast, you have those multiple forts that need to be seized. And these are actually just seized via, I believe it's just a range event where you just need to like wait or hit the seize button with any of your units and they'll claim that point. And then once it runs a check and once all three of those checks are made and the game recognizes you've seized all the points, the map will end. So this could be a pretty interesting way to have your army split up or thematically fight multiple forts at once in like a bigger, larger scale battle. Um, so that could be pretty interesting too. In a similar vein... We have defeat multiple bosses, so a couple of games have done this. I know most recently I've played Faith and Blood, where there's a chapter at the end of the part, first part where you have to defeat three bosses that are at different corners of a Fog of War map, so different ways you can handle that um, as well. And lastly, destroy supplies. I do this one personally in Vision Quest, but then also Radiant Dawn does this in that chapter in part three where you're burning the supplies of the Benyon Senators. So another another point to make where you can go and find different points on the map to destroy them. And then similarly to the scoring three points, the game is running a check to see that these supplies were destroyed, whether it's being run to see that have you triggered a certain range event, have you killed a specific enemy. You could set up logic on the back end to run that. I'm happy to chat through that. Not really the scope of this video to get into the technical details of setting this up. I wanted to more or less outline some of the options that you may have just to get you familiar with some different objectives. And this is all review. I expect a lot of you probably already know this, but it's good to just lay it all out and share some examples from throughout the series. Side objectives. Carla's here to talk about side objectives. She knows a thing or two about them um, being like the ultimate side objective. But side objectives are other things that happen throughout the map. So while your main objective might be something like defeating the boss, seizing the throne, escaping, whatever, these are the other things going on in the map that make you have to rethink your strategy. If there's only one objective, the map will probably feel fairly linear in terms of how you approach it. Okay, I need to get from point A to point B with my lord and seize. That is all I need to do to win the map, and I just want to defeat the enemies along the path. Side objectives can make things a little bit more varied and have to make you make different types of decisions. So cost-benefit analysis over, do I want to spend turns going and getting this thing? Do I want to risk taking more hits, more damage, fighting tougher enemies to get to a certain point? Do I want to rush to get to a specific village or chest, whatever? Um, side objectives definitely can make maps a little bit more interesting and engaging. And when interwoven really well, um, it can, can make a much more full, compelling experience. So what are some side objectives? That we can talk about today. I have a pretty good list here. Or at least I think it's a good list. I don't know. You guys, you guys tell me in the comments if this is a good list. But uh, visit villages or houses. So this is a classic, right? You have villages or houses that give you items that need to be visited. Sometimes you can pair this with like a bandit or a thief chasing them. Trying to destroy it to make the player rush a little bit more. But this can take you off a main linear path to get to where you need to go. 
Chess function very similarly, albeit in an indoor setting most commonly. But again, it really depends thematically on what fits. If you're in a village, you probably want houses. If you're in a castle, you probably want chess. But functionally, they serve a pretty similar purpose. Recruitable characters are another area that you can do to create side objectives. Like, uh, like for example, Carla is a great example of a... Actually, probably not a great example, but an example of a side objective where you have to enter an arena with Bartra at a certain level in a specific chapter that's basically like a five-turn survive while you shop. Um, it's a, such a weird chapter. But uh, other recruitable characters, like if you have to go get like... Um, what's his name? Like I guess a classic example is Fe one Navar. You have to go actually talk to him. He's a little bit out of the way, but otherwise like it gives you something else to do with your units besides just like rush straight to the seize point so recruitable characters can add some different elements i think another example of this is like douglas in fe6 where you have to leave him alive um, even though he's charging at you and attacking you and he's on the path towards the throne so you kind of have to think how do i best avoid him and not kill him if i do want to recruit him so recruitable characters can have some pretty interesting um add some i guess add some pretty interesting spin to your map as well um, if done correctly, especially when they're NPCs or enemies that you need to go to at a specific point in time. Other side objectives could be leaving specific units alive. So FE3 does this in the chapter with Shima in Gra, where you have the soldiers from Gra who don't want to fight and you have to leave them alive. And then you get like a specific reward if you actually do leave them alive. I think similarly, everyone's favorite uh, shoving priest chapter, I think it's called Solo in path of radiance to fe9 we're leaving all these different priests alive and then you get a staff at the end if you don't kill any of them and you have to use shove strats to get them out of the way that's not a great example of it but it gives you an idea of how you could use this objective um to just try and vary things up and again this is all helpful in creating that gameplay story integration we talked about when going through the framework um what thematically makes sense like Will someone join? Will I get this reward if I kill all these people who don't really want to fight me? Maybe I should try to find a way to incentivize that and tie this together a little bit better. So different things you can do there. Um, other times, just leaving a specific unit alive will help you recruit them later. So going back to the Port of Badan example, if you leave Dart alive in Chapter 16X, he'll join you a few chapters later. So leaving specific units alive, another different side objective you can do and kind of make you figure out, all right, what's the best path to approach? How do I avoid engaging this enemy that I really don't want to kill? Switches and trigger points are another different side objectives that you can do to kind of vary things up. I think Order of the Crimson Arm does this, uh, another FE7 ROM hack where there's a village that lowers a gate if you visit it. Uh, there's a FE7 and Lin mode does this as well, where you have the different switches you need to run to to reveal the boss. So these are other things that can be done to just kind of spice up more like vanilla objectives and keep them a little bit more varied, make you split up in order to give everything on time. So trigger points could be interesting. And even sometimes you can make defeating a boss a side objective. So something that may typically be a main objective, you may want to make into a side objective depending on the nature of your map. So I think... The first example that comes to my mind is in FE9, where you're in the prison escape chapter. So I think it's like chapter 10, the one with Volk and Brahm and Nephany and Kieran, and you're running through this uh, jail and escaping. There's this, The boss is really a side objective because he's on the map. He's in a room off to the side. You can go fight him if you want, but you don't need to. And he has some chests that he's guarding. So if you're trying to you know, get everything, you'll probably want to go for him, but you can avoid him. So it's kind of a side objective in that sense. Um, other times bosses may appear at different points and you could try and like defeat them. So like in a survive chapter that's ended by defeating a boss, like in some ways that could be, a, be considered a side objective because it's not your primary goal. So you can, you can mix and match these a little bit, but typically this is what you'll see as a side objective. So now that we understand a little bit more about objectives, what are some of your goals? when you're thinking about maps. So I've touched upon a couple of these already, but just to summarize, combining these elements to make the player think. If your map only has a single objective, it's probably going to be kind of boring and not very thought provoking. So you wanna combine different things to make the player plan and strategize and have to think through different scenarios. Uh, this is something that I try to do a lot is trying to put as many different objectives as possible to kind of create the sense of hectic, and panic 
so that the player needs to think through, all right, I want to get the chests. I want to recruit these characters. I need to also defeat this boss within this time limit. How am I going to do all of these things? Um, and I think that can make a map really exciting and fun. And we're going to go through some examples of that. Use objectives and side objectives to drive the player to move forward. So anti-turtle incentive is another really big one here. And we'll, that's a topic for another video and covered I covered in the Dagdar one. But you can use these objectives and side objectives not only just as incentives on the map, so just sprinkling them across for the sake of kind of taking a tour around the map, but if you have certain like timers and hard requirements and things like that, like you'll get the side objective if you get here within this number of turns. That makes it much more compelling and interesting, especially when you have to make that again, that cost benefit analysis of which way you decide to go to get specific items. And you want to create situations to drive replayability. So one of the things that's really good about side objectives is that if you have multiple objectives and it's hard to do all of them at once, it kind of creates this sort of like old school video game. Like I want to keep trying to get everything at once. Um, I know I've played maps where I failed to get everything. And then the next time I want to go back to it and retry it and try a new strategy to do everything. I don't really ever feel that way about really linear maps where it's like, okay, I just need to defeat the boss. Cool. I did it. Let's move on. Side objectives can be an interesting way to create these different situations to drive replayability, especially if they're hard to all get. Um, on a first try. So let's go through some good examples of how you can interweave different types of objectives to make the map interesting and compelling. So I've talked about this map before, Dragon's Gate, chapter 19 or 20, depending on which mode you're playing, of Fire Emblem 7. Why is this map good in this regard? Why does it have make good use of objectives? So you see up here, we have a seize point. This is where Darren is sitting and you're starting down here uh, besides having multiple paths which we talked about previously this map has a couple of other things you need to do specifically there are some chests over here that you can get there are chests over here that thieves will take and try to escape over to this side of the map lego is also appearing from here and rushing out so you have to run to get to him on time and recruit him uh, so there's a lot going on here that you need to be accounting for there are reinforcements coming from down here that you'll want to protect from Merlinus from. So there's some different things going on here that make otherwise like a fairly linear like map path to the boss. Like I can just draw like a line right here to get to Darren. But because I have to kind of like go over here to get these chests, I have to try and cut off these thieves that are running away. I want to make sure I recruit Lego with a specific character. It makes this map a lot more interesting and fun and challenging to think through how can I get all these objectives at once especially when you consider that there are multiple paths to get to the same point. So really good example here from the GBA era of those multiple objectives coming together. And another one I really like, and I talked about this one previously, so I won't drag on about too much. Blood Runs Red from Fire Emblem 9, Chapter 11. The player is starting over here. You have to arrive at this tile here, and then you have the boss here. So there's a couple different paths you can take to get the villages. So you have to split your army up if you want to get everything and still get to the arrive point. After a certain number of turns, the Black Knight appears out of this house. In hard mode, he actually starts moving. And so that's really scary. And so you'll want to make sure you avoid him. Also, there's specific units that you want to leave alive here as well. So you have the Vigilantes, who you get bonus experience for if you leave them alive. Similarly, you want to crude Zihark, who's among them. So there's a lot of different things going on in this map to consider. While otherwise, you know, your objective is pretty straightforward. Like, get right here. The moving boss, too, is just another really nice touch to this map. But there's a lot to do here. And it's one of my favorite maps to play every time I go through Fire Emblem 9. Doesn't this track groove, guys? Hang on, I sip some water. So here's another good example. I'm from Thracia, Fire Emblem 5. The Escape, Chapter 6. So the player's starting over in this section of the map here, and your goal is to get to an escape point over here. So this map, I think, is pretty interesting and a good example of merging objectives is that there's, like, a huge cluster of enemies here, and Galzus, who's, like, really a tough enemy, will appear after a certain number of turns from the spot and start chasing you down. So you have this soft timer that you're working with, and there's a lot of different things to do. There's villages that you want to get over here that put you kind of close to this larger cluster of enemies. There's the convoy. There are the shops. There are all these gates to open. 
and there's different ways you can approach it. I can just like try and fly and rescue drop people over to this part of the map and escape as quickly as possible. Or I can try and like go through this way to get all the items and escape. There's different paths you can take, different things you need to get. And it's all kind of based on time. So like while your main of goal is just to get to this point, again, there's so much to do on the way there and different paths to take to get there and different incentives or disincentives to not go specific ways. I usually don't like to run this way because there's this huge cluster of enemies and those bishops with meteor that I like avoiding. So I have to be pretty careful when I'm going through the side here to try and get all the villages and avoid dying on this pretty like hectic escape map, knowing that Galsus is coming and will probably kill everyone. I wouldn't call this like the best map design ever, but it gives you a general idea of how you can combine these different elements to make something that's straightforward more compelling. Here's another example that I like from Fire Emblem 8, Chapter 10 of Erica Mode, Revolt at Carcino. The player is starting up here in this section of the map, and you have a couple different things to do here. Like, the boss is right here. Like, you could really, like, cut off the bottom part of the map and just have this very, like, linear U-shape to get to Pablo the boss. What makes this map much more interesting, in my opinion, is that you have to protect Innis, uh, Garrick, and Tethys over here. They're in this little fort area. And you want to recruit them before they die. Uh, that's going to take you down this way. Similarly, Marissa, everyone's favorite female Myrmidon, is down here. And she's going to charge at some point. And so she probably will get herself killed if you're not careful. So you want to figure out how you can recruit her as well. And it kind of takes you out of this like very linear path to the boss as you're kind of going down the sides here. This map is by far, or rather far from perfect. There's no real like timer beyond like the soft timer of these units dying over here but some again some elements to consider right there are multiple units that you need to recruit one is an enemy one of them charges you and like will charge straight for a green unit and probably die if you're not careful so there are these different soft timers in place that you can deal with there's nothing really forces you to rush for the boss which i don't really love about this one but again combining those elements here's a better example i think also from fire emblem 8 same chapter number actually it's just ephra mode it's turning traitor. I've talked about this one a little bit before. Player starting up here. It's a survive map. And you want to make sure that you survive as well as Dusel, who's down here. He's got a couple of green units. And you want to run and try and protect these units in that turn limit. You have a boss over here that you can kill as like a side objective to end the map earlier if you can rush down here in time. And then there's also Cormag, who's a recruitable enemy that comes from here. And he's flying in as well. And you'd probably want to recruit him too because he's the only uh, Wyvern Rider that you get unless you promote like Tana or Vanessa into Wyvern Knights. But he's the only one who can go Wyvern Lord. But anyway, pretty varied, right? You have a village to get on your way down. You still want to rush forward to make sure you're protecting these guys. You want to probably get to the boss. Different things you can do besides just like trying to survive yourself here. Like if it was just like you need to live, then like why not just turtle in this spot? But because you have to protect this unit, there's a boss over here. There's a recruitable enemy over in this corner and you're playing against the hard timer. You really want to be thoughtful about how you go about doing all of these things at once. So I think this is a really good example of how to make different map objectives really interesting and exciting. And again, this is all very much interwoven um, with kind of that overall map design framework I like to talk about. But specific to the objectives, you can turn something that's really straightforward like a defend map and make it much more interesting by having different things to do to give you different rewards. So incentivizing the player in different ways. So what did we learn? So we're gonna be wrapping up in just a few. Um, I hope this was really helpful. These are some of the things that we learned. I hope that you feel um, a bit more confident doing these sorts of things. As far as this last piece on like avoiding putting the player in unfair and winnable situations that aren't fun to play, the real key piece with this is being cognizant of how you go about lining up these different side objectives and how feasible it is to achieve them. So for example, sometimes you may have like a really good reward and you want to make sure that the player has to really work to get it, but you also don't want to put them in a fair, an unfair situation to try and get it. Um, otherwise it's just creating a really poor experience. So be cognizant of that. Like maybe if you have like the player needs to defeat a specific enemy by a specific time to get like a pair of boots or something like that. Make the enemy beatable, 
right? Like they can be tough, but make it beatable. Don't like try and trap them. Don't use ambush spawns to like trap them for going for the side objective. Like don't lure them in and then like kind of punish them for it. Like that's not really fair. Um, so pretty similar, like don't use like poor map design principles like ambush spawns or range events that get triggered on the same turn. Cause that those are the kinds of things that when you're trying to maybe make maps a little bit more interesting and varied in terms of, Hey, I'm going to put this recruitable character here, but if they cross this point, the character will like move immediately, like on the same turn or an ambush spawn will appear when they go into a specific range of this unit. That's not really fair. Um, and that can be really tricky. So try to avoid those situations. When you want to make those side objectives, you want to figure out how do they, how do they weave together? How do I make it so that all of these are possible to achieve, but also challenging? And that's everything I got for you guys today. So I hope you enjoyed watching this short video on some map design objectives. I had fun making this. I know this one was pretty quick, but I hope it gives you some ideas of these different types of objectives that you can do and how to think about using them together in your own maps to make something more interesting and fun. Um, it's definitely a lot of work to do this. Like, you know, by all means, like it's not going to be this most straightforward thing, but it makes your maps that much more fun and memorable. Um, and here I am thinking of maps I played years ago that I still always enjoy playing again and again. And a big part of that are those unique objectives that make it fun to try and figure out how do I do it all? So this feels like the right music to end on. Well, anyway, guys, my name is Pondon. Thank you again for watching another map design guide. I'll be back with some more of this stuff soon. I'm thinking through a couple of other videos I want to make. But um, leave some comments below. I'd love to hear if you guys have any other suggestions or thoughts on unique objectives or making maps more interesting more broadly. One of the things I'm working on right now that I'm pretty excited to show off soon is a map where you get additional rewards by having green units escape a map. And so that's kind of like your pro that's like a nice different side objective that I didn't really talk about here. So getting creative with some of these things that turn otherwise like kind of linear maps into more interesting pieces. So like covering the escape of different units. That's not something you see very often in Fire Emblem. So it's hard to find good examples of that. But this was really fun. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And I hope you enjoyed. Have a great day. Be safe. And if you love someone, don't hesitate to tell them. Thanks again, everyone. Take care.